Th thank you. We now have about 20 minutes for discussion. Um, before we begin with the discussion, we have one, uh, one additional panelist who joined us relatively the last minute, so she never had a chance to, to talk. But I don't know, Danica, do you want to um, uh, say something in response to the other panelists' comments, perhaps? Thank you, Brian. Well, I was uh, maybe just going to reflect a little bit on how the uh, Center for uh, Devices and Radiological Health see some of these uh, opportunities. And as a matter of fact, the epidemic study was actually funded by, by the CDRH, and we work very closely with John Browser, and, and we are now applying some of these uh, apps in, in our um, attempt to augment the registry data with, with these apps to actually get better uh, reporting to the registries. So the way how we approach the surveillance is that um, uh, we see, because devices are different than drugs, and, and some of these data sources not necessarily um, uh, alone can be sufficient for assessing uh, performance of devices in the post-market setting. So we've, we've recognized the value of registries, especially for implantable devices, and we put together this vision document in, back in 2012 when we said, you know, the, the system of the future that we envision would have for medical devices would have in the core the uh, national and international registries linked to electronic health records uh, with uh, unique device identification embedded in them. And that's going to be our foundation of the system. And, and we'll then link to claims data for longitudinal files, and we'll link to other data sources augmenting with the discretionary studies, research studies, um, and other types of um, mandated studies that we ask companies to do, for example. Uh, so, um, uh, so the engine behind uh, uh, some of this innovative thinking uh, in device arena is the Medical Device Epidemiology Network Public-Private Partnership, called MD EpiNet for short. And it, as a matter of fact, uh, we, are in the, we currently have uh, uh, 55 ongoing studies on, of these innovative methods and, and infrastructure development with Methodology Center at Harvard University, Infrastructure Center at Cornell, and Coordinating Center at, um, at Duke University. So uh, we are working very closely with the planning board, which is uh, run by Mark McClellan and his team, uh, which is now envisioning the implementation of, of, of the FDA vision and the vision of the, of the national uh, planning board that we've actually helped uh, um, uh, spearhead uh, convening these, uh, these work. The other uh, last thing that I'd like to say, because registries are so important for medical devices, uh, FDA also spearheaded the, um, um, the convening of the, of the national expert group called National Medical Device um, um, Registry Task Force. And the, uh, that report had been published um, in August. And I welcome you again to read yet another multi hundred pages document, but I think it's really informative and it highlights some of these areas, especially where we are going uh, with devices is, the, uh, is this uh, concept of strategically coordinated registry networks, which then brings this connection with this type of uh, uh, safety um, <clears throat> efforts that you were talking about, because we envision the registries to be augmented with um, other data sources, other methodologies, including uh, the ones that you discussed. So that would be kind of where, where we are, and, and uh, obviously it's not because we would like to be separate from Sentinel or separate from other centers, but, but we recognize the specific unique needs of medical device development, and they cannot just go on the market and stay as they are. They have to be put on the market uh, in order to be actually tested and be iterated and be, become better for the patient. So we cannot afford to have large clinical trials that can be followed for 10 years and then wait and at some point approve it and then, you know, again, by the time, the product is obsolete. So that's why we are doing a little bit more of, a, of a innovative. And I'd like to also say that because of that and because of the statutory requirements and um, that are a little bit different in the device arena, a little bit more flexible, I would say, a little bit more um, uh, open in terms of what kind of data we can accept for, for regulatory decision making. I would submit to you that devices space is really should be very appealing, not only to epidemiologists, but other in the, in the methodology and other kind of scientific fields that, that you can actually uh, probably test some of these uh, novel methods even better in devices, not just for safety, but for effectiveness assessment. So I'll stop here because um, there are lots of other questions I'm sure, you, Brian, you had, but just kind of wanted to, to draw some of these points, why devices are deserve a little bit more of a... Uh, different approach. 
Thank you. Um, let me begin the questioning um, with a question to Rich. The, the other speakers were really discussing um, um, hypothesis generation or signal generation. Uh, um, Sentinel, until now, Mini Sentinel has mostly focused on hypothesis strengthening um, um, and hasn't been asked to do signal generation. As you move to the next phase and you're asked to do that, <clears throat> what are some of the methodologic issues you think you'll be struggling with? Uh, so we think we have a pretty good handle, actually, or at least an approach to uh, uh, to signal generation. Uh, we're using a scan statistic uh, called TreeScan as sort of the foundation on which we're doing that. I'd be delighted to engage with any of you who has additional ideas on, on how to do hypothesis-free um, uh, detection. One of the things that FDA has been particularly, and, and it's pretty slick, I have to tell you, it, you know, when you, when you look at the results, you say, wow, that's really, really terrific. FDA has been, um, I, I think, um, a, appropriately reserved about uh, sort of uh, having us uh, sort of run these kinds of analyses um, without careful forethought because uh, they, they make the, the entirely valid point that it's very reassuring when, when a technique like this reproduces the stuff that you, ex that you expect. And then the question is, what do you do with the ones that you didn't expect? Are you allowed to ignore them, or does, is the agency uh, obligated to follow them up? And so uh, I, as an investigator, I, I have to tell you, I, I, it, it pulled me up short the first time they said it, but they were absolutely, absolutely right. There's, uh, as, as a regulator, they, they, have no, they have very little latitude to uh, say, that must just be noise. So, um, so uh, uh, we 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 think we're well on the way, and and we're inching our way along to uh, to using that. The fir the first sort of um, real use in practice, we think, will be with the uh, uh, new HPV vaccine. That uh, uh, the, the reason that uh, we we th we think that's a, f a, a good uh, way to initiate that is. Um, in purely test mode, we can run it on the existing HPV vaccine and say, we're not gonna do anything specific about that, but then we'd have sort of a frame of reference to, to look at new kinds of things that might come out of that. And, and then, then we'll, with FDA's guidance, take, uh, take baby steps. I mean, we're always very attentive to the fact that um, 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 we don't ask questions just for general interest. Uh, there, there has to be some kind of regulatory concern driving them. Steve? Yeah, thanks very much. I thought this was a series of fascinating presentations. As someone who doesn't use most of these tools, I have to admit I'm much less inclined to use them than I was before <laughs> I heard these presentations. Um, so, so a couple of questions. One of them is that, um, as, as I think Alistair rightly pointed out, that there are con very different attitudes in various segments of the population, especially generationally in terms of their attitudes towards these types of social media. And so to what degree are you detecting the patterns of adverse events or problems in certain segments of the population and not other segments of the population who don't particularly use these tools? And then the second is the more that you publicize that you are doing these types of things with their data, are you impacting the likelihood that you will then subsequently be able to use this data once people figure out that you're looking at them in certain ways? So do they then use, lose their utility as you go forward because they become aware of the fact that you're doing this? There we go. Okay. That's a sign, right? Okay. <laughs> Not a button. <laughs> it's all about the user interface. So um, about, it, about discussion boards, the thing that's interesting about them is because they're topical, they tend to uh, automatically segmate your, or seg seg segregate your, your sample population, essentially. So we looked at breast cancer discussion boards specifically. And so we're looking primarily at breast cancer patients and the people who care for them or love them. Uh, those are the types of people who post on those boards. So they're mostly women between the ages of about 40 and, you know, 70 or so, um, and the occasional husband or sister or brother or even a parent in some cases. We saw that in some of the threads. So that, that definitely helps a bit, I think. Um, I think you have more of a problem perhaps with Twitter 
um, or, w or even with Facebook, although people do post some of their actual pictures or photographs on there. Um, so you can sort of tell what age group and what gender they are. And that helps a bit. Yeah, I'll make a, a comment. Um, Twitter and Facebook um, uh, are deeply social and there's a rich and uh, complicated reporting model. When someone decides to say something to their network or to the world, um, this is why I, I, we've done work in Twitter and with, with online search. Uh, search is more of the kind of quiet companion you whisper to all your concerns. And so there's less of the kind of concern with, um, is this important enough to tell everybody about? Um, we also have uh, classifiers that give us demographics. We understand ages, uh, gender, classifiers, probability distributions over these attributes to get a sense of the population. Um, do external events uh, like knowledge of the system someday uh, in, in a news report affect things? Yeah. In fact, uh, new, news influences on web search, especially for healthcare related concerns, have been a, one of the sources of some uh, notable errors like the Google flu trends a couple of years ago. There was a H1N1, I think, story in the news, and all of a sudden there was an overreporting by Google, Google flu trends um, that was shown to be correctable with classifiers looking at experiential versus exploratory or referential. Um, I, I think um, we can correct for and, and, and characterize these kinds of biases over time. I just think there's a, there's a tremendous amount of data coming in, and with the, it's not a trivial statistics problem. There are lots of challenges ahead, but, but these are really interesting opportunities for the field, I think. Um, you know, I just want to add, of course, I mean, we think about the, the demographics of each social network we're tapping into it. I think often people assume they, they skew much younger than they actually do. Um, but of course, there's important biases that exist across the board. And um, we're very careful about, you know, any level of, you know, estimation at the population level that we would take from this data. But I think actually um, the, the, the question about changing the nature of the conversation, knowing that someone's listening, is actually a very important thing. And I don't think it necessarily, it, it will change uh, the discussion, but I don't think it's clear w in which direction because when we've looked at it, you know, of course there's people that think, oh, the government is watching, so I'm, I'm unlikely going to to say something, but in the reverse, there's many people that think, wow, there's an expectation that someone's actually listening to my issues and, and trying to do something about them. And we've seen this many times in, in some of the social networks, especially disease specific, um, but even on Twitter as well, the fact is, you know, people are complaining to the airlines, they're complaining to restaurants. Uh, there's no reason why, you know, then we talk about drug safety, that's still part of that. So, um, you know, it, it definitely changes it, but I think the volume likely is to increase rather than decrease. Yeah, just to follow up, actually, um, I'm not so sure that I'm too concerned about the Hawthorne effect, uh, as it were. Um, I'm much more concerned about what the social network people call, and I mean social network analysts call external shock. So if, if speaking of flu trends, for example, when people knew that um, and found out through the press that, there, that Google was doing this thing with flu trends and, you know, you, you would see a spike in people looking for information on Google about, about the flu, um, are those signals actually real? That's, that's an example of external shock. And that's definitely a confounder that has to be adjusted for in any analysis. It's a difficult one because you don't always, you can't easily identify it. it this was fascinating. Uh, because I work in the pharmaceutical industry and I just happen to like to talk to people, I've come to the unscientific conclusion that in large segments of our population, drugs are bad and anything that's natural is good. Now, why bring that up? Natural products cause 10% of drug-induced liver injury. So the question is, if you did the same thing with natural products, would you find the same thing? In other words, is there an over-reporting because drugs are bad? And if you looked at natural products as a controlled case, would you find the same degree of reporting and accuracy in adverse event reporting? I, th I think John has something to add there. <laughs> right, yeah, because the grant that I described up here actually was originally intended to look at herbals and nutritional supplements um, with the assumption that people were much more likely to talk about these with people in an anonymous setting on the web than they were with even family members or certainly with their practitioners. And we're certainly right. There's plenty of self reports on the web, but almost all of them are about benefit, not deleterious effects. Not only that, but it is an incredibly difficult, much more difficult um, world to explore than drugs because most people know how to spell, at least phonetically, drugs. Um, when it comes to 
Um, herbals, not so much. But an even thornier problem is that many herbals and nutritional supplements are actually combination products. And it's impossible really to tease out exactly what's causing the problem. But this is a very timely issue considering that, you know, the paper just came out about uh, all these uh, many emergency room visits are actually, um, you know, being attributed to exposure to some of these supplements and natural products because uh, people are taking things, especially the combination products where, you know, nobody knows about the interactions that go on with them, not to mention interactions with other products that they might take or other drugs they might be on. So it's a very, very thorny problem. Do you get a sense of under or over reporting given this sort of drugs are bad and natural products are good bias? Oh, no question about it. Uh, the people who are in the natural, um, I, I would say the natural supplement taking business, as it were, um, you know, they're, they're much more prone to, to um, downplay the importance of prescription drugs and they're much more, uh, to put it, in some cases hateful, actually, of, of the uh, drug industry. Yeah, yeah I'll, make a, I'll make a comment uh, that in, in the web search log work, uh, we explicitly try to, um, through various me machinery mechanisms and designs, separate out the report that a drug is or a supplement is being taken from downstream people just qu questioning sets of, of, of um, sets of symptoms. And so we maybe that's a less of a bias in terms of good or bad for what the element they're taking is, um, because we try to... In fact, it's cleaner signal when it's not in the same session. It's somewhere else. It pops up later downstream after they it's a sign that this is an active ingredient in their lives. Time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, if, if anyone on the panel could help me with uh, series autocorrect, I would be grateful. Uh, what, what, what about what, what about Cortana? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, my real question uh, is to John. Really, uh, you mentioned briefly the dark web. Um, is there a substantive difference in the quality of information that you're getting from the dark web? And that extends back into the prior discussion. Once you publicize that you have access to the dark web, do you push them? But because typically people are on that system yeah. to hide from prying eyes. It's actually interesting. We're actually doing um, query logs in dark web, actually. So we're, we're we started creating advertisements in the dark web to look at query logs. And there's actually a lot of interest in collaboration, uh, actually, to be honest. So we haven't had any pushback from the operators of some of these sites. Um, but it's just different types of data. So we're very interested in supply chain and understanding the move, the flows of products. And often these, uh, these types of products are, 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 are coming up through the dark web and not any other channel, uh, especially when we think about counterfeits. Um, so it's just a different type of data class that we're, we're, we're getting involved with, um, you know, but people feel quite hidden in these networks. So actually there's not as much pushback um, as you would expect. And yeah, so, and just like our, our black market website, there's, you know, you would have thought there'd be a lot of people very concerned about reporting illegal activity on our website, um, but it's actually our most popular crowdsourcing tool. Um, and we get, you can look at it today. I'm sure there's hundreds of reports that just came in right today. Um, so people aren't as fearful of, of disclosing this kind of information. So there, it's, been, it's been actually quite collaborative, surprisingly. With, uh, with that, we're, we're out of time. Thank you, everybody. We're exactly on time. Thank you.